Raymond, we can start the show. Welcome to Miami Beach Urban Studios Live Art Talk. Today we're with Chat Treviso. My name is Colette Mello. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I'd like to thank Miami Beach Department of Tourism and Office of Cultural Affairs for sponsoring these art talks. Chad Treviso is a Brooklyn-based artist, designer, and educator. His projects are research-based and collaborative in nature that are, in, that are informed by the community. His public works have been described as playful, functional interventions. He is a young arts winner in visual arts and a U.S presidential scholar in the arts. In 2015, he was awarded the United States Artist Fellowship in Architecture and Design. In 2016, he received the Brooklyn Arts Council Art Fund Grant. And most recently in 2019, he was an inaugural recipient of the George M. Perez Award. Chad Trevisio received his BFA from the Maryland Institute College of Art. He has a master's degree in architecture from Yale School of Architecture. In addition, he's a Cook Scholar and was part of the New York Residency Program. He has been featured in Bomb Magazine and his works have been featured in the New York Times as well as the Wall Street Journal. He is currently on faculty at City, U City University of New York, Queens College and Parsons School of Design. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that if you have any comments or questions to make them through chat function and we'll try to get to them by the end of the presentation. Hi chat, thank you for joining us this evening. Hi everyone. Hi, thank you, thank you for having me. Very uh, happy to be here. Um, and so I'm gonna share my screen and uh, we'll get this presentation started. Wonderful. Do you want to just tell us where you are right now? Yeah, so I'm in New York City. I'm in Brooklyn. Um, it's where I live. I've been living here for about um, 11 years now. So I'm uh, in my apartment in Brooklyn. <laughs> all right. So can you all see my presentation? OK, wonderful. Um, all right. So um, my presentation is titled People Make Places. Um, as Colette uh, mentioned, uh, my background is in both art and architecture. And um, I'm actually originally from Miami. Um, I went to New World School of the Arts. I see Aramis O'Reilly is on here. Uh, he was my teacher when I was at New World. Uh, so I just wanted to give him a, a shout out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I was in, uh, in high school, a lot of my work was I was doing mostly painting. Uh, and drawing um, looks very look very very different than what I'm doing now. But if if there was a thread that um, I can think of that tied that work to what I'm doing now, is this interest in people and the social realm. Uh, so that's why I wanted to title this "People Make Places" because my interest in the built environment and space is so much about storytelling and the people who inhabit it. How we as humans can uh, turn a space into a place. Um, so, you know, as Colette mentioned, I'm an artist, designer, and educator. I'm also a co-founder of the multidisciplinary collaborative practice, Yeju and Chat with Yeju Choi. Um, and I'm gonna show you a little bit about the, of the work that I do now. Um, you know, basically the sort of work that I make is uh, collaborative in nature, as, as Colette mentioned. And I work uh, with communities. And when I mean communities, I'm talking about residents, uh, small businesses, um, community groups, young people. I, I do a lot of work with young people. Um, and essentially those who are most effect, affected by an issue or a project. I, I work with them to sort of build off of what's already happening in a space, acknowledging that there's already things happening, that people are already coming up with ways of addressing uh, everyday issues and trying to uplift that work as well as kind of build off of it uh, both physically and socially. Uh, so being very aware of the social, political, 
historical, cultural context of a place um, and coming up with fun ways of engaging. So when I think of design and I think of art, I also think about the process as part of that, right? Um, so this is one of the first projects I did as an independent artist uh, and uh, designer. Uh, it's what's called a quote unquote little free library. And I don't know if you've ever seen little free libraries before, but they usually look like little school houses tiny little kind of birdhouse looking things. Uh, so this is my interpretation of the Little Free Library. And this is in the Lower East Side uh, of Manhattan. And if you've been to New York before, you know that the Lower East Side uh, Chinatown area, or this area specifically is called the Two Bridges neighborhood, but it's kind of like a smaller neighborhood within a neighborhood. It's extremely multicultural, diverse area, really beautiful area. Uh, so we wanted to in encompass that idea in this project. And I collaborated with this organization called the Two Bridges Neighbor Neighborhood Council uh, to realize this project. And as you can see, the library says library in English when you look at it straight on, but depending on the angle you look at it, it changes the language, so in Chinese and English. And I work with their after school program to, again, sort of define what can happen here. But a, a big part of the work that I do, and you'll see this sort of common theme throughout, is trying to adapt um, you know, and, and use the physical built environment as a support structure, but also adapt spaces of exclusion, in this case, a barricade, in the previous one, a fence, uh, into places that bring people together. And a lot of this is inspired by what's already happening in a place, right? Acknowledging that people are extremely in, in, ingenious and in, in, inventive uh, and trying to celebrate that ingenuity. Um, so I, I, I look around my neighborhood. Uh, this is literally a five block radius from where I live. Uh, in Brooklyn, you could see all the different ways people are already using these structures. Um, this is a drawing series that I did called 101 Ways to Support, uh, Subvert a Wall. Um, and it's looking at ways that both in a fantastical way, but also in very practical ways that people subvert, undermine, uh, destroy, um, uh, circumvent uh, barriers, physical barriers, as well as systemic barriers, right? And one project that really kind of gets at the heart of this is this project called On a Fence that I did with Yeju. So Yeju and I, Yeju uh, is a graphic designer. Um, I met her when I was working at an architecture firm. She was the in-house graphic designer and I was an architectural designer there. And then when we both went off to do our own thing freelance wise, uh, we, we started collaborating. And this project right now, there's no art project. So you're probably like searching like, what, where's the art project? This is a before picture. Um, and this is a project um, that uh, got started because several community organizations in the Lower East Side in Manhattan. Uh, so a lot of my projects are in the Lower East Side in, in the South Bronx. So you'll see a lot of those um, right along the East River waterfront, wanted to turn this abandoned site into a public park. And these organizations got the city to actually do that and, and, and commit to doing that. But that process takes a long time, as you can imagine, to actually like get a, a, a park, um, get the funding, get the permitting. So the organizations were like, you know what, we should just turn it into a pop-up park, a temporary park, while the city is getting all this you know, regulatory ju jurisdictional stuff figured out. So um, Yeju and I, we were lucky enough to be selected to be one of the artists to create an installation on site. And this is what we came up with. Our initial idea was to tear down that fence, but they didn't want us to do that. So we're like, well, actually maybe we could highlight both kind of highlight and cover up the fence at the same time and turn this fence into, again, a symbol and a physical literal obstruction into something that brings people together. So on the outside, it's sort of a wayfinding signage that directs people towards the entrance. And then when you get into the inside, um, this fence turns into, um, has a whole bunch of different functional uh, components, bike parking, uh, you know, monkey bars, uh, a labyrinth, a uh, uh, chalkboard wall, seating spaces. Um, and, you know, the project was created through several workshops we did with community members. Uh, and, you know, the workshops, the way we think of workshops is, is that it's more than just like one charrette, one workshop here and there. It's actually kind of becoming part of the community, meeting people where they are, having conversations and, and getting to really build empathy and, and have a more informed lens. Um, so things like the sandbox wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for talking to kids. We're like, 
like, oh, you got to have a sandbox or, you know, having events after the project is built. The idea that the project itself is not done after it's built. It's actually the engagement and the participation that happens in the process um, uh, of it being up is also part of the piece as well as the construction of the piece itself. So I built it alongside uh, a construction assistant and volunteers, and that has always been a really interesting and important component to the work. You'd be surprised how many people will just stop, and especially in New York City where people are walking, they're like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> and then, do you need help? And they'll pick up a, you know, a drill and we'll start helping you out. So you know that I really cherish those moments um, in the work. And you can see here are some pictures of people interacting with it. So, you know, one of my interests in my work is um, to uh, look at how people, again, are using the spaces. And, and this is sort of a funny series that I started a while back called Everyday Erosions, where I've been documenting the wears and tears of our everyday built environment from, from use. Um, and I think that sort of almost being this, this detective of just kind of being hyper aware of how people are using these spaces is such an important element in, in the process of just ob observation of, of being able to kind of pick up on these little cues um, to make better spaces, right? Because again, people are constantly either adapting or kind of tell, leaving you clues that like this can be better or this we're already using this in this way. Um, so, you know, one project that, that really illustrates that is this project called Sit Anywhere Borinque en Plaza. And again, this is sort of a before picture of some of my neighbors in, in my neighborhood in Brooklyn. Uh, but I noticed a lot of my neighbors, especially the elderly neighbors who were living in this housing development called Borinque en Plaza, would take their sort of fold up chairs and hang out on the sidewalk, which totally awesome, uh, normal thing. Funny thing is that the housing development does have a sort of... Um, central community space, but people weren't really using it because where's the action? The action's on the sidewalk, right? That's where people are. Um, so, you know, I started a conversation and uh, with my neighbors and, and we started talking about like, what if there were actually benches here or people could actually sit, you know? So many cities have taken away seating spaces and so we could talk more about seating as, as, as a political act, but I really think to sit is actually a really interesting thing. It, it, it is the first step in creating this social environment, but also can have political implications. But, you know, in, in a more practical level, like we all want to sit down, right? Um, and uh, so I worked with the senior center um, that was associated with Borinque en Plaza. Borinque en Plaza is what's kind of known as a, as a NORC, uh, naturally occurring re retirement community where people have aged in place. So uh, Borinque en Plaza has a senior center associated with it. And in the senior center, we were working on trying to figure out the best location for um, the seat and also how the seating worked. And one of the things that came out of this uh, engagement process was realizing, and this is what came out of it, realizing that we wanted to make the seats uh, accessible and that they would fold up so people can still sit right next to their neighbors and um, if, if they were in a wheelchair. So that was actually a really interesting design component that wasn't the initial design idea, but came out of these conversations. So that just shows the importance of actually engaging. And then the site of it, and going back to this idea of the observation, was informed by the fact that people would hang out in this one spot. So there's a tree, it's really you know shady in the summertime, it's really kind of a nice spot. And it's close to a corner, which is also really, um, uh, engaging place where a lot of people are hanging out. Um, and this whole idea of sit anywhere has become a kind of common theme uh, in my work. This is sit anywhere subway column. And if you've been in New York, you can, you know that like oftentimes you want more seating waiting for the, the train. So I wanted to create this like version of, of hacking the subway column. <laughs> um, and then, so, you know, this is sort of my interpretation of, of a parklet. But you know, you can see here that a lot of these projects are playing with this idea of sitting, playing with this idea of adaptability. Um, this project was done also in the Lower East Side, and again, engaging communities in the Lower East Side to uh, celebrate the culture of the place. So this project was actually inspired by um, a lot of new development that was going on in the in the in the neighborhood. Uh, this building here is actually done now, but this was back in 2016. Uh, it was under construction, but it's this huge, huge luxury tower that was built in this neighborhood. And uh, a lot of neighbors, a lot of community members were very 
concerned about it. You know, they were concerned that they were going to be displaced, that there was just going to be this wave of gentrification, and uh, for good reason. Um, there was an article in the New York Times that was kind of disparaging the neighborhood, talking about it as if there's like, quote unquote, nothing there, right? Um, and But there was something there. There was history. There was culture. There were people who were living there, right? So we wanted to celebrate this, and I collaborated with this artist, Sam Holleran, to create the, this sculpture that was essentially 110 shapes that were created by community members. So we asked people of all ages, kids and adults and uh, older adults to cut out um, shapes. And then each color had a certain meaning and people would tell us stories about the community. And then the size of the shapes themselves had to do with the, the, how long people had been living there. So in a way, these shapes kind of became avatars for uh, people in the community. And after we took down this version of the project, we installed it on the fence. Any chance I have to install something on the fence, I will. <laughs> um, this project, uh, the Boogie Down Booth, is a series of uh, installations that I've created in um, in the South Bronx uh, in New York. Um, and uh, this project came about because I did this fellowship um, with this organization called the Design Trust for Public Space that was looking at ways to improve spaces under elevated transit infrastructure. So think um, elevated trains, elevated um, highways, uh, bridges, all of that. And uh, New York City actually has over 700 miles of elevated transit infrastructure. So like, what do you do with that space, right? In New York City, usually you have like parking under that space, but uh, we wanted to think of other things we can do with that space. So my role in the project was I was the participatory design fellow, which basically meant my sort of self-appointed role was uh, to go out, reach out to communities, uh, community groups and grassroots organizations that were already doing work under these spaces, again, acknowledging that people are doing this work already and trying to figure out ways we can bring our knowledge as well as the sort of institutional support that, that the Under the Elevated project had uh, because we were partnering with the Department of Transportation to leverage the work that they were doing. Um, and actually get, get things done and use this as a catalyst. So uh, one of the things that, that we ended up doing was create these sort of uh, pop-up installations. And one of those installations was the Boogie Down Booth. And this was done in collaboration with this organization called the uh, Women's Housing and Economic Development Corporation, WETCO. Um, and uh, they had already done a, a lot of really great work in the neighborhood. And uh, after doing several different engagement uh, opportunities um, on the street, but most Mostly just going to um, their events. Uh, they have all these like events that, that celebrate Bronx music, um, talking to small businesses in the area, um, talking to community members. Uh, we came up with this project. And one of the things that came up was the fact that this site where there's a bus stop had no seating, right? So issue number one that we heard. Another issue we heard was that it, it gets dark really early. The train makes it feel like it's sort of oppressive, dark. You're under this elevated thing. And then finally, it's really loud. The train is loud. Can we do something about that, right? So we came up with this project that um, obviously provides seating, but then also provides lighting, all solar powered, and then plays music. And for those who, who probably a lot of you know, but maybe if you don't know, um, the Bronx is where, you know, hip hop was born. It's also where Celia Cruz lived for a long time and Tito Puente and uh, La Lupe and, you know, so many <laughs> amazing musical artists, right? Uh, so we wanted to celebrate that history as well as celebrate current um, uh, musicians and uh, promote small businesses in the in the area. Um, so that's what the Boogie Down Booth did. And uh, you can see here it's all solar powered. And these are some of the musicians that were featured, Circa 95, a current hip hop duo. Um, this is Fulgencio Marcela, who ran the, the fruit uh, stand here, who were kind of eyes on the booth. Whenever I would come by, they'll be like, oh yeah, you know, this school group came by and they were hanging out, but that light was flickering. So you should probably get that checked out. Uh, so this is at the, at the opening, we did a sort of ceremony to bless the booth. Um, and then uh, Wetco uh, asked me to come back and make more Boogie Down Booths after I had finished the fellowship. So this is the second Boogie Down Booth we created. Um, and this one was created uh, along this fence that was um, uh, next to this park. Uh, which, you know, the booth ended up sort of being a catalyst for the city to fix up that park, which was locked up for years. Um, 
you can see here the light. And then in this one, we asked some uh, middle school kids, uh, there was a school right next door, there's a school here, uh, to paint uh, sort of a, a mural, stream of consciousness mural on, <laughs> on the booth. And this was at the opening. This is a, a band, uh, Garifuna uh, band. Uh, this is um, the third Boogie Down booth. This is sort of a freestanding one. These are some kids paying, painting the, the mural there. This is at the opening. This is my sister, actually, Yara, <laughs> who's also an artist. Um, and then this is the fourth Boogie Down booth. Um, and this one is kind of fun because this one's actually from 2019. So we, we took it down last year. And it was only, it, all of these have been up for about a year. Um, we can talk more about that. Deals with mostly permitting and, and New York um, public art, temporary public art uh, sort of rules. But um, this one had sort of two sides to it. Uh, so on, on the back side, you know, you can have uh, performances and uh, the cool thing about it is that that faces the subway. So people actually can be, you know, standing on the subway um, sort of um, landing from the stairs uh, and see performances. And this is a band that was playing um, some bachata and other, other uh, musics from Dominican Republic. Um, so, you know, one thing that maybe you've noticed uh, in my work is that I like colors. I like really bright colors. I like to make things really accessible. I like to make things um, out of found materials, out of really common materials, um, make it so that people feel comfortable approaching it, you know, scuffing it up a little bit and it still looks good. <laughs> like, it's fine, you know? Um, so, you know, oftentimes public art, when you think of public art, you think of sort of like a statue in a public space and it's, you know, clean and pristine. And, and mine is about people interacting with it. And it's also about play. It's about, you know, making it <clears throat> so that, you know, making a, a space that's fun uh, and play being a, a really important component of our uh, development as, as human beings, as young people. Um, this is a project I did with a group of youth uh, in the Lower East Side. Um, it was sort of an after school program, but we created this uh, public art project uh, collaboratively. So they were, these were high school students from the University Neighborhood High School. And this is just, this project came about because the, the teens were like, you know what, we don't really have a space to hang out. We don't really, you know, have a place that's for and by us. So this is what we came up with. Uh, and they, they, they titled it Some Blocks. Um, and, you know, a lot of these projects with this idea of play, um, I think, you know, play and sitting are two really big themes in my work. Um, and, you know, you, this is a sort of sprinkler system that I created for this like a uh, summer event. Uh, sort of playing with this idea of like in New York, you've probably seen this in movie, people will like turn on the fire hydrants uh, to cool off. So I kind of wanted to play with that idea. Um, and then this project here is a project I did with Yeju uh, last year at a children's museum. Um, this was pre-COVID, <laughs> right before COVID. Um, but the, the project was to um, create this sort of kaleidoscopic uh, tubes. Um, the exhibition uh, was at a children's museum and, and the space that they gave us uh, had this sort of column in the middle of it. So Yeju and I wanted to celebrate that column in a way uh, as, in, instead of hiding it. And we created these tubes that once you go inside, they're just these sort of hypnotic, psychedelic, you know, uh, effects. So you can see here how, you know, even though we're trying to think about design in a more collaborative way, and, and that in itself has certain political implications, um, it, we're also really interested in creating beautiful things, creating things that are playful. Um, this project, uh, is a project that uh, Yeju and I did in, in, um, in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. Um, and this project actually came about um, because we wanted to create, well, the city was doing this big infrastructure project. They were kind of ripping up all these streets to redo some of the, like the stormwater drains and all this sort of stuff. And they had a percent for art program, which basically means that they had a certain amount of money dedicated to public art. And we were lucky enough to be selected to be the artist to create the project and uh, the public art project. And what we decided to propose was like, well, what if you just embed, because you're gonna be rebuilding these sidewalks anyways, 
what if you just embed the art into the sidewalk? So, um, you know, our initial idea was to create this sort of sidewalk and that each one of these color bands would be made of a completely different material. But that presented issues, obviously, because, you know, some materials might settle differently than others. It might be a tripping hazard. Um, so we ended up, you know, going back to the drawing board in a way. Uh, we wanted to still do something on the sidewalk, but then we went and talked to some kids. And there's a Montessori school over here. And for those who have been to Montessori school or have kids in Montessori school or know a little bit about Montessori school, you know that Montessori school is um, very experiential learning, very tactile. And these were the people who are going to be using the sidewalk anyways. On this side of, of the sidewalk, there's like a park. So we, we wanted to make sure that those kids had a say in what happened here. And, you know, what did we hear from kids? And these were their, their designs. We want obstacle courses. <laughs> we want this space to be like, yeah, yeah, colors and patterns are cool, but like make it fun, make it something that I would actually want to like play. So in a way, and I thought that was like really interesting because it started sort of exploding this idea of, you know, playgrounds as like we usually think of playgrounds as being these dedicated, you know, spaces that are, you know, you know, isolated um, and start thinking like, well, what if the city itself is a playground? It's already a playground. Look at any kid. They'll they'll like jump and not try to touch any cracks, cracks in the sidewalk. They'll like, you know, jump from one spot to another. They'll walk on the edge of something. Right. That's that's play. Right. So we wanted to really accentuate that idea. So into this project, we we, we incorporated these funny mounds that like had no purpose <laughs> you know they were just kind of there they're they're high enough in some cases for people to sit um so they could be for sitting um they were also you know uh, sort of the sloping surfaces that of course were attractive for bikers actually cyclists were really <laughs> would go up and down these mounds a lot um you know you can see here the kids would go up and then of course sk skateboarders really liked it um so we were all about that we could I could tell you a little bit more about, you know, some of the issues that came up with this. Some people didn't like the skateboarders as much as we did, um, which, you know, is an interesting case study, at, you know, about the, the difficulties of community based design sometimes, sometimes not everybody uh, agrees. Um, but again, going back at this idea of play as being a really important element. But this project and also that um, project I did with with the youth that after school program prompted this other project, Yes Loitering, which, you know, up to this point, I've shown you all these sort of pop-up community-based projects that are uh, sort of responding to people's everyday needs in very sort of tactical, you know, and, and sort of um, uh, temporary or, or kind of, uh, yeah, temporary tactical ways, right? And, um, Although I, I still very much like that sort of work, and I think that work is, is very valuable, I also acknowledge that that is not necessarily solving the problems, right? That's, that's not solving the kind of systemic root issues that maybe cause, you know, the fact that there's no sitting there or that there's, you know, um, so lately and especially, you know, the last couple of years, I've been also incorporating more kind of research-based projects um, and work into my practice. And one of those is this project called Yes Loitering. Um, that's looking at, you know, obviously we've all seen the no loitering signs. Um, and this project is sort of flipping that and saying like, no, actually we think of loitering as this bad thing, but what is loitering at, at you know, at its core? Loitering is just hanging out. And why is hanging out a bad thing? Like, don't we want people to hang out? Don't we want people to activate spaces? Uh, and of course, you know, we know the, the answer to that. Um, and so we were exploring this idea of the criminalization of hanging out uh, in relation to youth and young people, especially young people of color. So uh, I worked with a group of teens in the South Bronx. Uh, this was the first sort of core uh, group uh, of, of teens. Uh, and what we did is we went around we first started documenting all the no loitering signs, but then also signs that were very specific to youth. So, you know, you see some signs that says no minors. And um, and this was like a makeup store. I don't even know, like, I don't even know that that's legal, honestly. <laughs> like, um, this this is a, 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 you know, 15 minute uh, time limit for restaurant, uh, you know, no outside food, uh, no ball playing, no skateboarding, no, you know, no bicycle no bicycling, like so many things 
no hoodies, which obviously is like, you know, even more coded uh, racialized language, all these different things that are um, very much telling young people and others, um, you're not welcome here. You can't, you can't be yourself. You can't express yourself here, right? Um, so we wanted to first explore this. We talked to some public defenders who really kind of made it clear that this isn't just sort of a nuisance. This is actually has consequences, right? So we have zero tolerance policing, the school of prison pipeline, and ways that young people might get tied into the criminal justice system at an early age for just maybe trespassing or, or being loud somewhere or whatever, right? Especially black and brown youth, right? Um, so then we went and talked to people, young people all over the city. We did surveys. We, we had young people draw their kind of vision for um, you know, uh, public spaces that were be youth affirming. And we came up, and these are some of the surveys, we came up with um, a website. And in the website, we have 12 recommendations uh, on ways that we can create more youth affirming public spaces that include the four most important ones are youth involvement, social equity, safety, and location. Youth involvement, meaning that young people shouldn't be involved in every step of the process. Um, social equity, meaning that we should take into account uh, histories of inequalities and oppression and and sort of redress that uh, safety, meaning that like maybe you don't always have to call the cops. How can we come up with ways of creating safe spaces that doesn't include criminal justice and, uh, you know, incarceration uh, location, meaning that sort of like the the project in Cambridge, uh, instead of having sure we need more Youth, space, youth community centers and, and uh, you know, recreation spaces. But what about the whole city? The whole city should be a place that's open and inclusive to youth. Um, and then other things included more seating, Wi-Fi, you know, things that are, are kind of, um, but these are sort of at the core of, of these four, th of this, this general issue. We also created um, a uh, manual for small businesses, because the, the, the issue of the criminalization of youth and, and public spaces isn't just about you know, parks and plazas and streets. Uh, oftentimes, and what we heard a lot from young people is that uh, whenever they were in stores is where they would get you know, most questions. You know, they're like at a sneaker shop or you know, at a restaurant or something like that. And people would look at them weird or like people would ask them like, do you need help uh, multiple times until it got to a point where I was like, oh, I get what you're saying. You're just like monitoring every single move um, that I'm, I'm making, right? So we wanted to talk to some small businesses, especially to kind of help them, you know, rethink some of their store policies, reevaluate how they're forming ties with the community. And also because they're small businesses, we also want to make the point that young people are customers too. And you shouldn't treat them badly um, because it's wrong, but also because, you know, they are your customers and, and uh, think about it that way. Um, so then another research project that I've been working on is uh, and connecting going all the way back. And this is the last project um, uh, I'll show, and then we'll have some time for questions, um, is going back to the whole interest in um, walls and fences and these objects and spaces of exclusion um, is I've been, um, well, actually, let, let me back up. I mentioned I'm from Miami originally, and um, I'm you know, interested in architecture and urban history and urban theory. And uh, I came across a book um, called A World More Concrete by NDB Connolly. And in that book, uh, Connolly mentions um, several walls in Miami uh, that were built to separate and segregate neighborhoods, right? One in Liberty City, um, that is maybe the most well known in Miami. Um, and uh, I actually emailed Connolly and I asked him more about this because I was like, oh, you know, I've, I've heard about some of these walls, but can you tell me where I could learn more? And he's like, there's actually no comprehensive study of this. So I've been since 2017 trying to map and track this history. Uh, this is actually a uh, picture of uh, from 1939 of an architectural rendering of that wall in Liberty City. But I've also been uh, mapping fences, barricades all over the country. Um, and there are remnants of these structures all over the place. This is the one in Miami. There's also another one in Miami in Coconut Grove. Actually, there are several in Miami. <laughs> They're all over the place. Um, this is in Melbourne, Lake Worth, Florida, Arlington. Um, 
And, you know, this is not the final design of this, but the idea eventually is to create a, a website where people can post uh, sort of comments and stories, because I want to make sure that th this story is told by those uh, who are most impacted by the project. So um, trying to tr track this history is something that hasn't really been um, so under acknowledged um, um, history um, that hasn't really been told. Uh, and in addition to this, I've been working with uh, a group of uh, young people in Liberty City um, with this project called Wall In with Arts for Learning Miami and uh, Jermaine Barnes, architect Jermaine Barnes, to have young people themselves uh, sort of um, be the ones to determine what to do with these spaces or how to activate these spaces. So um, the youth are coming up with design proposals for um, uh, the, the Liberty City Wall that's speaking to that history of, of uh, that wall as well as current issues. And hopefully we're working on um, realizing those projects in the coming future. So that's what I do. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Wow, that was wonderful. I love these public art projects. I'm very, um, I want to open it up for questions or comments. Uh, if anyone has any comments or questions, please put them in the chat. But one thing I wanted to ask you, um, I really like how you empower the community um, with these, these spaces. And I think I know when I see um, seating here in Miami, sometimes it will have um, barriers to the seating. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about the politics of, I know you mentioned it briefly about the politics of, of seating and- um, Oh yeah, definitely. Oh yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the sitting issue is mostly because you, so many cities are trying to deter unhoused people from sitting, right? And uh, the, the effect of that is one, it's unjust, I think. Uh, two, it makes for less pleasant public spaces for everyone. Um, and, you know, I think obviously that there are some sort of subtle ways and not so subtle ways this happens. One is the exclusion of seating, as well as, um, you know, having armrests as a way for people to not be able to lay down. Um, the way I see it is like, instead of taking seating away. Well, first of all, I think we just need to provide housing <laughs> for those who are unhoused. Uh, that's one way to solve that problem. Um, but two, I think if we just have more seating everywhere, uh, I think that is another way to just say like, well, okay, fine. Like maybe some people need to lay down here, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean we won't have other seatings there, other places, right? So um, I think that, and then when you get to like the sort of tradition of seating as a political act. I think you get into sit-ins and that idea of claiming a space, um, I think is a very powerful one. But then just again, on a very basic social level, this idea of resting and being able to be part of a community, sitting is such a big part of that. Yes, thank you. I have a, let's see, I think I have a few questions or comments, okay. Um, this question is, do you think the city of New York has made it difficult for their communities to engage with each other because of gentrification and lack of accessibility? It seems like many of the places you spoke about have been sort of sidelined by the city. Mm. That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I mean, but the gentrification is not just New York, it's everywhere, it's in Miami, it's in every city, right? And when we talk about gentrification, I think this is an important thing to um, mention. Uh, gentrification is not um, development, right? It's not necessarily having more housing or having, I think what people are very concerned about is when that translates to displacement when that translates to the death of a culture, of a neighborhood, right? And, um, and I think when, when you're talking about, you know, um, low-income communities, communities of color that are, that are experiencing gentrification, that's usually what we're talking about, right? Where people are being displaced um, and people are, and they're being displaced because rents are going up. Uh, because, you know, they aren't able to afford, but then also like their neighbors are having to leave. So then that sort of social fabric is being torn apart. Um, so, I mean, I think that's happening everywhere. I think there is a real issue of affordability everywhere. And I think that's, you know, one thing that's, that's sort of um, 
tearing at that fabric, right? That, that communal fabric. Um, and, you know, I think, but I think, you know, there's some efforts here and there um, that are being put in place. And I get, I, you know, I, I hear in the last two questions, the need for policy. And I think that that is something that I'm actually really interested in with the last two projects that I've been mentioning. There are some physical design interventions that can happen, uh, but without the policy part, and that's where the politics comes in, right? Um, we, a lot of these things can't really be fixed on the root level, right? So incorporating more inclusive zoning and more uh, community participation and empowering people to actually uh, have a say. And, and I think those are all important steps towards, uh, you know, uh, making a more just and inclusive and open city. Yes, I agree. Um, I have another question. Uh, how has a pandemic affected your practice working primarily in the public realm? Yeah, it's affected me and I'm sure it's affected all of you in your own ways. Um, I haven't been able to create public art since the pandemic uh, started. Um, I have been focusing on uh, my research, A Nation of Walls, um, the wall research project. Uh, I wrote an article um, in Places Journal all about the wall project. And I've, I've really been focusing on that lately um, because I'm still able to interview people over Zoom or on the phone uh, for that project. Uh, but yeah, when it comes to public art, it's, it's been hard. It's been hard. I, I did have a project that was lined up for, you know, summer 2020 that ended up getting uh, canceled, you know, uh, slash postponed because of the pandemic. So it's, you know, it's difficult, but you know, that, that's, that's not to say that it's impossible to do community engaged work during the pandemic. Um, and I, 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 this isn't necessarily from my own experience. Well, I could say it from my experience as an educator, and I don't know if other educators here might be able to relate. Um, the, the Zoom experience has been difficult but has also opened up certain interesting possibilities um, in terms of how people engage, having people write things in the chat as well as speak up, as well as like using, you know, different sort of whiteboard, virtual whiteboard platforms where people are doing sticky notes. In some ways, I've felt that certain people have been more engaged than, than just a regular classroom setting. And I'm only presenting that as an example because I think you can take that and also see it as like, okay, but you could actually come up with creative ways of engaging people even during COVID times. And I think that's one thing that, that um, I and, and, and Yeju and, and Yeju in chat, uh, but also when I do my independent work that we're really interesting, interested in is coming up with creative ways of engaging people that aren't just like the traditional, when you think of public art or urban planning or sort of that, world you think of like maybe some community meetings and workshops charrettes and then like calling it a day and it's like a, just a check mark and, and the things to do um but what about like actually interviewing people creating oral histories being you know and i think you could do a lot of that sort of stuff um over zoom and i've also heard that, that like uh, a friend of mine who's an urban planner told me that he had an, a community meeting and it was interesting because one of the people who spoke at the meeting was this baker and she actually, um, small business, she actually was working at the time of the meeting. So if, if it was a physical meeting, she wouldn't have been able to be there. But because it was Zoom, she was able to be there while working. And, you know, so anyways. I heard a lot about um, students working while they're in class. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Multitasking. Um, but I think that's a skill that we all need. So, um, Here's another question. Um, I was wondering if there's any call for how to address homelessness in a way of public spaces, example, showers, temporary rest areas. Um, really enjoyed it and love the way you involve kids. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, you know, my personal opinion is that we just need more housing. And, you know, it's uh, so many cities spend billions and billions of dollar with dollars of, of just like these sort of stopgap uh, uh, temporary things and, and shelters. I know in New York City, uh, our mayor and uh, has spent billions, you know, trying to put people in hotels and things like that, when really what 
we need is just housing, affordable housing and programs that help people, um, you know, get back on track. And, you know, there might be people who choose not to, you know, live in, in that housing and, and that's fine. But most people just want a safe place to live and not fear, you know, having to um, be kicked out from, you know, because they got this huge medical bill or they can't afford, they did, they got fired. Like, you know, I personally believe that everybody has a right to housing. Um, so I think that's, that's the thing that we should do. Um, all those other things are just sort of temporary things that isn't really getting at the real core. Like, why do we need, um, you know, showers? Well, it's like, because people don't have a place to go. And there are so many interesting models um, of, of this. Um, but yeah, I just think we need more, more housing that is, um, that is just accessible to all. Yes, I agree. Um, I wanted to ask you about, you, you know, you mentioned this, um, we're, t we're in this moment where we're tearing down um, monuments and you're using space to bring people together and to start conversations. Could you talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah, for sure. I think that's a really interesting question. And I, I would, I would um, pose a, a, a certain uh, distinction um, between monument and memorial. Um, so the conversation of tearing down monuments, I think, is a critical one. When we think of monuments, we think of statues or other, you know, objects that celebrate or honor a specific figure or event. Uh, but it's, it's a sort of way to like literally put someone on a pedestal, right? Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to a memorial, which is a chance for us to remember something, right? And that remembrance can be something that might have been tragic or, or traumatic. Uh, but in that remembering, we are uh, reclaiming uh, and also, um, you know, reframing, right? And I think that's a critical distinction. And, and I also want to clarify that I don't think that every single one of these segregation walls and race barriers that I've been researching should stay up. I think most of them should be torn down for sure. Like a lot of these structures are literally still dividing communities, um, literally still blocking roads and not allowing people to get from one neighborhood to another easily, right? And that's by design. That is not a coincidence, right? So I wanna make sure that like there, there's nuance and, and, and complexity in all of these conversations. And I think in the end, I would say that those who should be making these decisions are those who are most negatively impacted by it, right? So I might have my own personal opinion, opinions about it, but I think those who are living it and living the injustices should be the ones who have the, the greatest say in what happens because it is their community. Um, and, you know, that's, that's how I feel about it. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to, you, you do a lot of public art. So obviously you're, you're doing a lot of writing or applying for grants. And I would like to find out you have a background as an architect and as a visual artist, can you talk about how that all comes into play and maybe the permitting, pro how long does it take for a project to come to fruition? For, for example, like um, the one you did in 2017, um, we call this. Oh, we call this. We call this uh, place home. Like how, no, how, place how home. long does it take for a project like that to come to fruition? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and lately I've been, um, doing this sort of behind the scenes lecture a lot with students uh, because I'm realizing I wish I had gotten this <laughs> sort of inside look on how you make public art but you're totally right so like most of the work that I do is funded either through um, grants or fellowships or um, uh, or RFPs slash RFQ. So for those who don't know, RFP, RFQ stands for uh, Request for Qualifications for RFQ or Request for Proposals for RFP. And that's essentially when, you know, there's a call uh, soliciting, you know, design services um, or art services, right? For public art, you get a lot of RFPs. And I mean, everything is a little different. A grant 
is usually you're proposing a project and there's a certain set of money uh, and a certain timeline. Um, uh, a, a, an RFP usually has, let's say a public art RFP, I'll, I'll say it because RFPs can be for anything, architecture, graphic design, whatever. Uh, but public art RFP will have a site usually uh, already designated and a budget. Um, so those are, you know, a little bit, you know, the parameters are a little bit more um, defined. Um, and then the other ways is sort of private commissions, right? So um, the, the, we call this place home um, was more of an RFP style um, uh, project. And that was done through a, uh, so most of my work, uh, actually all my work is either through um, a city public uh, agency or, or a nonprofit um, organization. So that one was actually through this nonprofit called Hester Street in partnership with the Department of Transportation in New York City. Um, so the permitting and everything was already set as part of the RFP because DOT was associated with it. Uh, for the private commission ones, um, the way those have worked is um, WEDCO, uh, those were, were, I guess, technically private commissions, even though they're, they're a nonprofit. They got a grant from the uh, uh, Department of Small Businesses Services, and then they asked me to design uh, or create a, a boogie down booth. Um, and then together we sort of figured out the best site for it. Um, and, um, and then we, we, you know, at this point, like the public arts division in the parks department sort of knows me and knows us. So like, you know, we, we sent them our proposal. They don't give us any money, um, but we just have to show that like this thing isn't going to fall apart. <laughs> it's not going to hurt anyone. Um, and then we also have to go and talk to the community boards. Uh, I don't know if Miami has community boards, but in New York City, each you know neighborhood has a community board made up of of community members and and they have to approve it and city council members have to approve it um and yeah and they give us the permit so it's a process but it always helps to have partners um who can help with that process um so wetgo did a lot of that sort of uh, back end sort of work of of organizing because they know a lot of the community board uh, leaders and the council members because they do affordable housing and and um, you know uh, economic development in the area um, and that's you know I, I think it's a big part of my work is always partnering with people who are already on the ground who who are part of the community and I'm not just going in there to sort of be this design savior sort of thing I'm I'm just collaborating and co-creating uh, with those who know the space best. Thank you. Um, I wanna, uh, we're almost out of time. So I wanna end in this conversation and it's been wonderful. I, I've been, it's been great hearing about your practice and public spaces and your work with the community. Um, but I wanna end it with, if you could, um, we have a lot of students on the call. If you could give some of our visual arts students uh, some advice as a practicing, uh, artists, um, what would you say is the most important thing for them right now? Ooh, that's, that's a big question. Thing. Whatever. Yeah. No, yeah, that's a, it's a good one. I, you know, uh, I might not give the most satisfying answer um, because I believe that everybody's different. <laughs> I think that everybody has a different track and um, there's no formula um, for you know, the best way to go about it. You know, I, I went into art school thinking I was going to be a painter. And then I took an urban theory course and it totally changed the way I think about cities and the built environment. Um, so, I mean, I guess if anything, don't be afraid to experiment to just take that class that you're kind of interested in. You never know if that might change the way you think of the world and your art. Um, and be open. It's great if you have a sort of plan of where you see yourself going, but also be open to new possibilities. Um, and, you know, if you're interested in, in this sort of work, feel free to email me. I could tell you more about, you know, resources. Uh, there's some really great resources out there. Of course, you know, you're all students right now. A lot of those resources are unfortunately not available for students. Um, but, you know, places like Creative Capital, um, that has a lot of really great um, workshops and they also, you know, list opportunities and things like that um, and are, are really great, you know, for, for artists who are just getting started. But also like I didn't, I didn't start out, I didn't graduate um, school and then just went straight into my own thing. I worked at an office for a while and, and going back to Colette US, 
Uh, you mentioned my architecture background in relation to the grants and that, that actually was really helpful. Uh, working at an architecture firm has definitely not only informed uh, on a theoretical level, the work that I do, but also on a practical level, because architecture firms are constantly applying to RFPs. Like I actually learned how that process works. Like, oh, okay, you need a resume, a bio. Uh, this is the sort of way to frame this stuff. This is the sort of way to kind of submit this stuff. And then I also, I also because I worked at an architecture firm that did a lot of civic realm work, I also learned a lot about the nitty gritty jurisdictional bureaucratic ways that cities and municipalities work. So, you know, you never know where you're, you know, and well, where you'll end up. Um, so I just, I guess my recommendation is just keep an open mind and, and there's no formula for anything, but just do what you love to do and work hard and, um, and, and, and build a trusted network. I think that's also really important. Build a very close trusted network of friends, colleagues, mentors who will look at your application for this and that. Like I do that every single time I apply for something, I'll send it to my network of friends and colleagues and like, is this, does this make sense? Is this too architectury? <laughs> is this too jargony? Um, so, uh, it, you know, that's always really helpful. Well, that is great advice. I, yes, be open to opportunities, network, and, you know, maybe go in an unexpected direction. Yeah. So I, I agree. Those are great words of advice. So I just want to say thank you again. It was wonderful to learn more about your practice. I'm going to open it up um, to everyone. If you'd like to unmute yourself for a moment, just to give um, chat a virtual applause. Let's see if I can do that. Um, unmute. Oh, you can... <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you. Fabulous. Wonderful. And I look forward to seeing all of you all next week. We have another art talk uh, next week as well. So thank you all for joining us, and thank you so much, chat. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. I hope to see Project down here soon in Miami with you. Yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Take care, chat. Bye, Mr. Riley. Good, good, to, good see to see you. Good to see you, <laughs> uh, Everyone stay safe. Stay you safe. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.